grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. It's uh, week four of our Not of This World sermon series, and today we're going to be thinking about and reflecting on what the Bible says about sexuality. And I want to be clear up front that we can't talk about everything related to this topic in one sermon. Uh, maybe you're wondering how this applies. If you're single or divorced or widowed or struggling with questions of identity, we're not going to answer every question today. And although that's the case, Christ still has a message of hope for every single one of us. I also want to point out on your sermon notes the QR code towards the bottom and that black square thing, that's QR code. That'll lead you to a form where you can submit questions or responses or uh, aha moments, whatever it is that, that you might have unanswered still about this topic and you're curious to know more. Uh, you can submit a response there and we'll have it open for most of the week and uh, when it closes then we'll compile those and put together some answers and, and kind of put a document together where we can answer some of those questions. If you put your name on the one that's optional that says name, it won't be anonymous, right? So if you want to be anonymous, just don't fill out that part with your name, right? Okay. Now, if you're also out there and you're like, how does a QR code work? Fear not, okay? Plenty of space here. You can write out a question or two, whatever it may be, rip it off and put it in the plates by the doors as you leave later on today, and we will get those uh, answered as well. So we start then with the foundation of marriage in creation. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In this second creation account, the very first thing that God makes is man. Yes, there's dust and there's this mist, and it kind of combines to make this marvelously malleable mud, from which the Lord God makes man. He takes from the Adamah, the mud, and makes an Adam, Adam. He makes a mud guy. He makes Adam. It's the first thing that God makes in Genesis chapter 2. But here's the kicker. The last thing that God makes is the woman. In between, God creates a garden, plants it, fills it with trees, locates the man there, and then creates every other creature of land, sea, and sky to find man's suitable helper. It's profound and beautiful truth on many levels. As the story is recounted, the man and the woman and the relationship between them become the bookends for all of creation— Everything that exists within creation exists within that framework between their relationship, that foundational marriage relationship. So Luther, as he writes in the large catechism, is correct that this marriage relationship is the foundation that norms and shapes all that God has made. Small wonder then that God will create, or establish, rather, a commandment just for this alone. Just for marriage. And how appropriate, then, when Luther explains that commandment, he doesn't give the usual don't do this and don't do that part. He said, stresses, instead stresses what must be done. Use sex the right way and honor marriage. Everything in creation hangs on this. It's the book ends. It means also that marriage is a gift and an ordering for all of life. Marriage is a gift and an ordering for all of life. This creation account has much to say about our relationship with the rest of creation also. It's all here for us. Of course, that doesn't mean that it's ours to dispose of or waste as we please, but it's here for our delight. And frankly, it's also here to keep us company. You see, God wasn't trying or experimenting until he finally got it right with Eve. He crafted each creature for man's benefit. And there are lessons to be learned here. All that exists around us is here for us to enjoy and experience because it's a creative gift from God. 
created for the sheer joy of it. It was very good, God declares. And so this creative world around us is God's gift, and we explore it, we take care of it, we delight in it, we celebrate the wonder of all that God has made. But in light of today, in light of talking about sexuality, we also recognize what the story teaches us about God's plan for marriage. Aside from the obvious truths, the truths that our world routinely rejects and resolutely mocks, the truth of one man, one woman, one flesh for life, that truth, aside from that, marriage solves man's oldest and greatest problem. Loneliness. It was not good that the man should be alone. This loneliness is not merely an empty house, an abandoned playground, or an aimless afternoon. This is not loneliness eased, much less solved, by sharing a drink called loneliness. No, this is a deep, soul-level loneliness of being trapped inside your own self-centered world. Disconnected from everything and everyone else. Adam may have had a glimpse of this early on that sixth day of creation, before he got busy naming all of the animals and before God brought him his newly built bride. But he only tasted the full horror of solitariness on the day when he and his wife ate from the tree. That action of defiance plunged them both into utter independence and crushing isolation. They were no longer naked and together as one, but ashamed and guilty and afraid and isolated. Marriage was meant to remedy man's aloneness, but the man and the woman denounced the gift of the other. They turn away from one another and from God, and they curl in on themselves. The fall is man curved in on himself. He's turned away from God. He's turned away from the other that God has given, turned in on himself. Me, myself, and I, selfishness and pride. And by this sinful act, the creation built within this framework of the man and the woman and their relationship is cut loose from its grounding, has been tearing itself apart from within ever since. The great sin against the sixth commandment is not premarital sex, pornography, divorce, cohabitation, gender fluidity, same-sex marriage, or even adultery. The central sin is the self-serving, self-chosen, autonomous, independent, willful solitariness that rejects God's gift of the other and then uses the other for self-fulfillment. What do I get? It's all about me. So instead of God's creation revolving around his good will, we in our sinfulness reorder the creation, reorder God's gift, and now it revolves around us. What I want you become the center of your universe, and God's singular creation is ripped apart. And now we have 7.9 billion multiverses revolving around 7.9 billion eyes, each and every one of us, a God or a law unto themselves. That's the sin we must confess, the sin of renouncing the reality that God put in place on day six of creation, rejecting and refusing the gift of the other, shunning his plan, throwing it all away. This sin, this old original sin of dethroning God and crowning ourselves, this absurd sin of demanding for ourselves the damning hell of self-centered autonomy, that's what we need to confess of. We all sin against the sixth commandment. We push against the plan. We reject God's gifts. 
We reorder the universe around ourselves. Children, adolescents, single, married, widow, divorce, we are all guilty, and we all must confess. But thanks be to God, the story doesn't end there. Sin and isolation do not have the final word. Where Adam and Eve turned away from each other, turned away from God and curved in on self, Christ has turned toward us. And for this reason, a son left his father, became a man, and joined himself to his bride, his wife. The word became flesh. He became the incarnate bridegroom of his people. He loved his creation. He loved it enough to join it. He came into this shattered world looking for his people, looking for you. And although maybe you tried to hide or sought to be alone, he found you and he forgave you and he joined himself to you in your utter loneliness and made you his. You belong to him. You are his chosen bride. For you he lived. For you he died. For you he rose. He is the only and final answer to the greatest sin you've ever committed. Your greatest sin and your greatest need. He is the answer to your desperate solitariness and your sinful isolation and your self-chosen autonomy. Just as marriage was meant to solve Adam's problem of loneliness, so too has Christ come to solve our deepest isolation. He's united himself to us. He is our eternal bridegroom. And this, this is this profound mystery that Paul says is Christ and his church when he's talking about marriage in Ephesians 5. It transcends time and place It's found in Jesus himself. He is the head. The church is the body. He laid down his life for her. He sanctifies her, cleanses her, washes her, speaks well of her, justifies her, presents her to himself and to his father, spotless, blameless, sinless, holy. That's what Christ has done, and that's what he has done for you. He loved you to death on a cross that he might cleanse you, forgive you, raise you, glorify you, and join you to himself and all of creation. It is a profound mystery. So now what? Now what? Well, the way of faith is to receive the gifts as they come from God, including our sexuality. The way of unbelief is to refuse them and look for loopholes to justify our refusal. See, the Pharisees come to Jesus with a question to test him. So you already know that the question is not an honest one. They want to corner Jesus trap him in his own words, get him to take a side, liberal or conservative. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What kind of question is that anyway? Are they looking for a way out? Are they looking to accuse someone? Why would you ask such a question? Well, Jesus answers their question with a question. What did Moses command you, he says? That leaves a rather wide open field, don't you think? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalm 90. Moses wrote a lot. So he invites them to consult their mental concordance and come up with a verse themselves. And which would they choose? They choose the loophole, the accommodation, the exception. Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce, 
and to send her away. Well, not exactly. What Moses did say is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 24. And that says, if a man divorced his wife and gave her a certificate of divorce, and if she went and married another man, and if he divorces her too, then she can't go back to husband number one. That's what Moses gave an accommodation for. It was an accommodation, Jesus says, because of the hardness of your hearts. Hard hearts are unbelieving hearts, unrepentant hearts, hearts unwilling to receive God's good gifts. Including the wife or the husband that God has given you. Not so from the beginning, Jesus says. Jesus trumps Moses with Moses, Deuteronomy with Genesis, the accommodating loophole for the gift. The gift that we are called to receive faithfully is God's design for marriage and sexuality. One man, one woman, one flesh for life. So what does faithfulness look like? Well, maybe for married couples, it means putting the needs of your spouse above your own, seeking unity in Christ, and guarding your relationship against the temptations of the world, and they are legion. Whether they come in the form of pornography, adultery, or selfishness, guard your marriage. It means honoring the vows that you made before God, knowing that marriage is a picture of that mystery of Christ's sacrificial love for his bride, the church. For singles, faithfulness means living in purity and contentment, trusting that God's plan for your life is good. It is good, even if it doesn't include marriage right now or ever. The church has often overlooked the gift of singleness. But scripture reminds us that in Christ, we are all part of his family, fully loved, fully valued. Your life has profound meaning. Profound meaning and purpose as you serve God in your own vocations. For those who are divorced or struggling with brokenness in their relationships, faithfulness means trusting God's grace to heal and restore. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin, although it's never God's ideal. His grace is greater than our failures. Faithfulness also means seeking out, pursuing, and praying for reconciliation finding godly counsel, trusting and being in, in, uh, supported by the group of people that you love and care for, trusting that God's love remains constant even in the midst of separation and pain and difficulty. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's what Moses said in the beginning about husbands and wives. Before the fall, before Adam and Eve's rebellion, and their self-justifying, self-absorbed, self-oriented turning in on self. Before there was sin. And then Jesus adds to that his own clincher. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Answer, no. They are one flesh by the word of God, and that cannot be undone. They may divorce, and Moses even accommodates and legislates their divorcing, But divorce is never lawful, no matter the circumstance. It may be tragically needful. It may be inevitable. It may not be possible even for two baptized children of God to put 
marital Humpty Dumpty back together again. But it is never lawful. And that's a good illustration of how the law works. It always accuses you. It always kills you. It never lets you off the hook. And even when it does grant you a loophole or an exception or an accommodation, it loops back around and bites you. You cannot justify your actions with the law. You cannot sit in judgment of another and not be judged yourselves. You cannot somehow make things right, make up for things, atone for your sins, fashion your own righteousness. You can't do it. Only he can. Only Christ can. You see, the disciples were troubled by this, and they asked Jesus privately. It clearly bothered them. And Jesus, he doesn't pull any punches with them. Instead, he turns up the volume. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Moses' loophole is sealed shut. No divorce, no remarriage, gifts refused, hardened hearts. Until death us do part. Death, not divorce, is what ends the one flesh union of husband and wife. Anything else is adultery. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't just point out our sin. So what if you have had a divorce? What if you have committed adultery? What if your marriage feels strained or broken? What if you've made mistakes feel the weight of shame and guilt. Here's the good news. Jesus doesn't just point out sin. He carries it. He carries every last part of it. He carries all of the brokenness that you've experienced and committed. He carries all of it to the cross and he bears it for you and he's dealt with it fully and completely and totally. Divorce, not the unforgivable sin. Adultery, not out of God's reach of grace. Christ's death and resurrection offers complete forgiveness no matter how far we've fallen, and it can be no other way. Christ alone offers that. This is a profound mystery. So while the law accuses us, leaves no wiggle room for loopholes, Jesus stands in the breach. He reminds us that we're not defined by our failures, but by his faithfulness. You and I, we are forgiven on the count of Jesus. Whether you're single or divorced, married or struggling with your own desires, you are are Christ's beloved. He doesn't leave you in isolation. He doesn't leave you in shame. He forgives you all the way. He restores you all the way. And he invites you to live in the freedom of his grace. Maybe you're still thinking, but pastor, I know people, I know pastors even, who have been divorced. Yep. So have some of you. So have some of your family. So has some of your friends. So has 50% of our society. 50%. That's inside the church and outside it. So in case you're sitting there smugly with your happy marriage and thinking, I thank God I'm not like them, You do well to remember Jesus' words about that lustful look or that adulterous thought. You've already committed adultery too. Maybe now it's starting to sink in a little bit just how fearsome this law really is. 
It has no loopholes. It crushes the sin-hardened heart. It holds no space for self-justification. It's all Jesus. And it's all gift for you. You can't justify it. You can't excuse it. You can't make up for it. The law will not help you. Also means you can't go around asking questions like, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? In fact, you're better off not asking, is it lawful, because you already know the answer. It's not going to help. Think about how far sin has corrupted the good that God gives. Think about how sin has dulled the joy that Adam spoke of when he first laid eyes on his bride, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Praise the Lord. Think about how sin takes the joy of the wedding day and turns it into drudgery and weariness so that religious people come up to Jesus seeking a way to divorce. Satan is behind all of this. That is sin at work in our old Adam. Adam, who turned his back on his bride, turned into himself, and then when he was caught, pointed the finger right back at her for his own sin. It's played out in so many broken homes and families, just barely glued together. It's a great and deep sadness. It uproots families. It leaves children without father or mother. Husbands and wives who are one flesh are at each other's throats, tearing that flesh apart. And even in homes that appear to be intact, there are undercurrents of boredom, discontent, complacency, neglect, and more. It was not so from the beginning, Jesus declares. That is not the gift that God has given us. There, there in Jesus, not in Moses, not in loopholes, not in the law, can you find hope and certainty. There in Jesus, in Christ alone, and in his marriage to his church, that is where you have hope. That's where you have certainty. And Paul calls it a mystery. And indeed, it is. We didn't read it today as part of our gospel lesson, but just after that, part of our reading in Mark 10, there's that familiar story of the scene with little children. I think it's kind of fitting since children usually get the short end of the divorce stick. See, parents were bringing children to Jesus that he might bless them, and the disciples rebuke them. They rebuke the parents for bothering Jesus and all the fuss that the little ones were making. What on earth did Jesus want with children, they thought. What kind of messianic army could a bunch of infants be? It's not that they're sinless. It's not that they're innocent. It's that they're utterly givable to trusting their parents. They must be carried. They can do nothing. You can do nothing. Jesus has done it all. They receive it as a gift. And Jesus takes them in his arms and he blesses them. And when you were brought to the waters of baptism, Jesus took you up in his arms and he blessed you. You didn't do anything. It was all a gift on account of him and his word and his work for you. Like a little child, whether you were an infant or a grown adult, a newborn, new life, a new birth. And it's in the littleness of faith that you receive the gifts from God our Creator, forgiveness, life, and salvation, and all that he has to give you in this life including the one with whom you are one flesh, your husband or your wife. And death, 
death can never part you from the Lord. Remember that marriage is an ordering. It arranges things within God's good design. It puts our being male and female back together again. Sin brought disorder and chaos into creation. And it ruined that order. It turned man in on himself. It affected every aspect of our humanity, including our sexuality. And nothing illustrates that more deeply than when you look at the world around us, see how distorted and perverse the desire of the sexes for each other has become, and the confusion the world has around what it means to be male and female. Marriage is a gift. It's an ordering of all of creation. It points to this mystery of Christ and his church. And because Jesus is now your husband, your redeemer, your savior, and your Lord, you are now back where you need to be, rightly related to God, rightly related to all of creation. You're back. Back in that framework of that marriage relationship between man and woman. Back where you belong. Whether you're single or married, widowed or divorced, you're back. Rejoicing now with your bridegroom and waiting for the wedding feast to get started in earnest. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Blessed are you. You are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Amen. Amen.